Hello and welcome. My name is Melissa Robinson, but subscribers can call me Missy. With Christmas rapidly approaching, it is time to deck the halls, or if you're like me, just your Christmas tree. I don't do a lot of decorating for holidays, okay? But I do love me a Christmas tree. And with that in mind, one of my favorite Christmas traditions is a Yankee Swap style Christmas ornament exchange that my husband's extended family does. And it's just so fun. And whenever you have a Yankee Swap style exchange, there's a little bit of a if everybody wants your gift. I am trying to find an ornament that is really unique that I think people will want to fight over because, you know, what's Christmas if you're not trying to start fights with your family? <laughs> Anyways, every year when we have purchased our ornaments, there's been a little bit of that question of, is somebody else going to have found the same ornament as I have? Last year, my solution to that was to make our own ornaments. And while nobody really fought over my ornament, it was still a lot of fun to have something completely unique and just to design an ornament. Um, if I have a picture of last year's ornament, I will put it up right here, right now, for your viewing pleasure. So of course, I wanted to make the ornaments for this year's exchange again, and I did what anybody does, and I was just scrolling my Pinterest and I have a lot of pictures coming up from medieval illuminated manuscript. To be more precise, all of the little margin monster details. And I'm seeing a lot of little weirdos popping up. And I am like, this is it. If I saw that at the exchange, first of all, I would think it's really funny. Second of all, I would want it. Next comes the question of what am I going to make this out of? And I did more scrolling and I'm seeing these vintage ornaments and vintage toys where they're just little wooden toys and you pull a string and I had an ornament like this on my tree um, growing up where you pull the string and the little arms and legs go up. Very simple little toy and I thought in my head, I. I might be able to make that because I have a lot of unearned confidence <laughs> and I'm gonna do it. Anyways, I have been over describing and rambling for far too long. You want to see what I did? So here it is. Here's what I did. All right, to kick things off, I went ahead and found some images from illuminated manuscripts. Now, there were a number of the most blessed, and by blessed, I mean, of course, cursed, little weirdos to choose from. And while I personally would love, say, a creature whose posterior largely resembled a man's face, I thought to appeal to a broader audience, I could stick to the cute furry little guys that are just being violent. Again, while some of my favorite ones were of the sweet little bunny rabbits committing war crimes, shall we say, I opted for some perhaps more whimsical ones. Thus, the bunny rabbit fighting the dog, and their adorable, what looks like a cross-section of an orange that they're using for a shield. It might be something different altogether, but I like to think of it as protective fruit. An orange a day keeps the dog -ter away? Okay, that was bad. I'll see myself out. The window out the window. But actually what I'm doing here is setting up to use my laser engraver and cutter. I first had to clear out some space on the other side of this window, which meant finding my child's shoes, which I've been looking for for months. 
I then use this folding table to provide a flat surface on the ground outside. And I put a sheet of tin on top of that and secure it with some masking tape to the table so that the table itself doesn't get damaged. Because I use that table when I sell my art at events and stuff and I don't want it to get messed up. When all of that is in place, it's time to put the actual machinery outside and then I can plug it in to the cords that I have just here next to the window. I got this laser cutter and engraver for Christmas last year and it's just a really inexpensive one from Amazon. And I have to manually focus the laser, which can be kind of problematic. I'm not entirely sure what the issue is, but sometimes things don't sit quite flat so that parts of my project don't cut or engrave quite as well. Here's a little peek at the software in use and at the actual cutter. Actually, I think it's engraving right now, engraving away. And yes, this is currently the best setup I have to fit needs such as ventilation and access to my computer. And while it's not the most ideal or most comfortable, it does work. So this is what I do. I first engrave the pieces and then cut them. This looks like I'm checking to see if it cut all the way through and it didn't quite. So I think I ran it through a couple more passes. But eventually it does the trick and I'm ready to assemble. This was a trial run because while I had a lot of confidence that my idea would work, I wasn't fully certain. I'm not an engineer, so I needed to test this out to see if it works. Well, actually I think engineers do that too, so maybe I am an engineer. Just kidding, I'm really not. I learned a few things with this trial run and one of those things was that the first time I went through and I drilled the holes with the smaller drill bit and then widened it out with the wider drill bit but that seemed to cause the wood to chip and so it is really better if I can just use the correct size drill bit. Additionally, what you're seeing me doing here is tracing out the shape so that I can drill little partial holes to fit the top and the bottom pieces together using some dowel spacers. So what I'm drilling right now isn't going to go completely through the wood so that the dowel can just fit just inside of that and then be glued into place. I needed to do this to the front and the back so that they would fit together. Then I unwisely decided to try and cut the dowel with a knife. This was a big pain in the butt, but I didn't feel like going out to my shed to get a saw, so here I am. Was it worth it? I don't know. Once I got all of those cut out, I began to super glue the pieces together. I started by super gluing my little mechanisms to the arm and leg axles. And then I glued the spacers to the body pieces. At some point here, I realized that the dowels I cut for the axles were a little too short but I had already super glued them together. So what I did was I sanded down the spacer pieces so that it would just barely work. Then I tied my string to the little mechanisms. I decided that since this was my trial run, I wasn't going to bother too much about the legs, partly because it wasn't going to work out, they were going to be a little bit too tight, and partly because I just wanted to see if I could make this mechanism work. And I did see success, as you will see in a moment. It was this project that brought my attention to the fact that violent, murderous rabbits were something of a medieval genre of humor, a medieval meme, if you will. So, following the footsteps of Monty Python, it is now time for a bit of silliness. Ho oh there, peasant! Dost thou have knowledge of the fearsome beast which the king, his royal highness, hath sent me to dispatch? 
I seen it I have for killed me own brother. Who is the bravest man in this country century past? In the past century, that is. For he killed Wyvern not two winters past. Prithee, peasant, what canst thou tell me of this beast? He's got huge, sharp... He can leap... He killed my brother, who once split a log big as a man with one swing of his mighty axe. Thou hast no doubt seen a terror truly horrible to behold and best forgotten. However, what canst thou tell me of its hide? Scaly, no doubt, yet how tough! Scaly? No, not scaly at all. In fact, fine, soft, head to foot, covered in the most glossy of fur. But covered in the blood of its victims. A fell beast, to be sure. Yet tell me of its fangs, its claws, which must be prodigious indeed. Yes, its fangs. Two of them, in fact, to their front of its fell maw, yellow and sharp. Claws not so long, but it can leap quicker than lightning, and thrice as deadly. Quite. I shall be on my guard for that, to be sure. I do have the finest armor this kingdom has to offer. Yet, it must have other notable attributes. What more can you tell me? Indeed, it fairly does have notable features. For the first thing you will notice when you see it come across your path is its ears. Just go on its head, like this. Verily, such a great beast with ears as you describe, they must be large enough that I should be able to forge a scabbard of them for my great sword. No, not so large, for it uses its small size to catch the weary unexpected. Small. So, so, like, like a large dog. No. There. What? Like a rabbit? Yes, exactly like a rabbit, but deadly. But it's not a rabbit. Is it? You silly people! I believed I was sent after a monster! A monster? Yes, indeed! For this is no ordinary rabbit! It is the most foul, cruel, bad-tempered little rodent you've ever seen! Oh. It's got a mean streak, a mile long, that hungers for blood! Now that I had seen some success, I moved on with some somewhat more deserved confidence. To begin a design, I would trace out the manuscript drawing in one layer. This would become my engrave file. Then in another layer, with the opacity turned down, I would color in the shape a little outside the lines to create what would become the cut file. I would repeat all of that, making a new layer for each new piece I would be engraving and cutting. I then rearranged the shapes so that I could engrave and cut more than one piece with a single click and better utilize my wood. With each file saved, I imported everything into Photoshop so I could crop my files precisely so they are all the same. I don't know Photoshop well enough to have just done it all in Photoshop in the first place. I have a problem. My weather app lied to me that floozy. So now it's snowing. It wasn't supposed to snow until nine o'clock. So I am going to put something down up there to keep it from getting down here on my stuff because I need to get this cut out today. 
Okay, at this point I have all of the designs on the computer ready to go. I just need to cut them all out, but while I wait for the laser to be working on engraving, I can start painting some of the pieces that I already have engraved and cut out. So that's what we're going to do. I mixed my acrylic paints on a stay wet palette so that I could get up and continue working my laser cutter slash engraver and I wouldn't have to worry about the paint drying while I was getting everything rearranged and set up for each new engraving and cut. I watered down my paint quite a bit, partly because I liked that watercolory effect and partly because I didn't want the paint to obscure the lines that were there from the laser engraver. With all of my pieces cut and painted, I was ready to begin the process of assembling. I noticed during my trial run that my wood had a tendency to chip and splinter under the drill, so I wrapped my pieces with masking tape, which helped a lot. I taped the two body pieces together to ensure my holes lined up. I also ditched my method of making a template to add and match up holes for the spacer dowels because that didn't work. And I drilled through the back and partially into the front piece so that the dowel didn't go all the way through but would have a little notch to rest in. Okay. At this point, I have two little guys done and they are making me so happy. <laughs> They're fighting. The only thing that makes me sad is the fact that these are going to be given away. But like... <laughs> Just trying not to think about the fact that I'm going to have to give these little guys away because they are just... Oh, they're awesome. Okay. I got to continue. I've got two more. <laughs> I've got two more to assemble. So let's do that. The rest of the assembly process was the same as with the trial, except... I learned from my mistakes and didn't cut the axles too short. I also used an appropriate tool to cut my dowel rod, and there was much rejoicing. <laughs> the most nerve-wracking part of the entire process was gluing the top and the bottom pieces together because I was using super glue and super glue is super runny and also super gluey. And I needed to make sure that I didn't accidentally glue any of the moving pieces.
so that's it. These guys are all done. I am so tickled by how they turned out. They are so stinking cute. I think it was a really good idea to go with the little furry creatures. I just can't get enough of them. I'm just, I'm gonna have to make a set for myself and probably for my kids too. My kids also really love them. These are basically like vintage action figures. If I were to critique these, and I am going to right now, I would just say that some of the rough moments that are going on with the dowel rods, I could have sanded those down so that they're not so rough. I'm okay with them showing, but if I wanted to, I could have sanded them down and used wood glue instead of super glue and painted over top of the dowel rods so that they don't show as much, but I'm okay with them showing. It doesn't bother me at all to have them showing. The other thing is that this one cut along the edge of the wood, so you've got an abrupt cut off there at the back of the ear, but that's also at the back of the ornament, which is not meant to be seen, clearly. Another little critique is that this dog was originally supposed to have the tail up and the arms down and have it to where you pull the tail down and it pushes the arms up, but I assembled it incorrectly, but it still works. I'm not mad at it. <laughs> yeah, other than that, I am so pleased with all of these little guys. Thank you so much for watching to the end of this video. If you really liked the video or if you liked anything about the video, go ahead and hit the like button. And if you would like to see more of what I do, I do a lot of random stuff. I do sewing projects, I do home improvement, I do art. I do crafts, and so if you would like to stick around, go ahead and subscribe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye!